Welcome to class number five, where we're going to study the stars. So we know that there's planets out there, and we know that planets can appear to be stars, but all the twinkling dots that you see in the black night sky the, that aren't planets are stars, and stars are essentially like our sun. They're balls of fire burning brightly, consuming energy, and we'll see later that there are lots of different sizes and colors and things like that. But there are essentially little, little suns out there shining their light across the universe to reach planet Earth. And if you look up on any on a, on a night and say it's a nice dark clear night, you might see about 3,000 stars in the sky just with your naked eye. But if you had a telescope, you could see maybe 100,000 stars. And that's just, you know, regular, uh, regular little, little telescope. But if you looked out with, you know, the Hubble telescope or some, uh, some greater thing, or even beyond, beyond what we can see, there's billions of stars. The stars just go and go and go, and they're beyond counting and beyond number. Some of them we have, we've named, but billions of them we have not even yet found, let alone named. So um, the, skies are just, the stars are just countless out there. Another little thing about the stars, too, is when you see them twinkling, the stars actually don't twinkle. Like if you look at our sun, our sun doesn't twinkle. But the reason we see the stars twinkle is actually because of our atmosphere. So the light is consistent coming from those stars, but when it hits our atmosphere, our atmosphere distorts it and makes it twinkle. So when you look at them through like the Hubble telescope that's outside of our atmosphere looking at the stars, they actually don't twinkle. So let's take a look at stars and uh, figure out another piece of our, sort of our universe. A quick side note that I think you'll be interested in that's worth mentioning is we talked about how there's billions of stars and we've named a few of them. But I wanted to just quote this verse to you because I thought you'd find it interesting. Um, Psalm 147, verse 5, or verse 4 and 5, uh, says, He determines the number of the stars and gives to all of them their names. Great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. Which I thought was amazing that God knows every star that he made and has given each and every one of those stars names. Even more interesting is the verse before it, that says, the Lord builds up Jerusalem, he gathers the outcasts of Israel, he heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. And I thought, if God knows all the, uh, the names of the billions of stars out there in the universe, how much more does he know the names of every soul on the face of the planet? And he wants to bind up their broken hearts and he wants to um, heal the brokenhearted. So, a little side comparison that I thought was interesting from Psalms and stars to people and souls. Okay, we're going to talk about the changing sky. This is going to be a tricky one to explain. I'm going to do the best I can on video, but I'll also have some supplemental videos to maybe have some experts explain it a little bit better. So the sky changes in the night from winter to, to summer, spring and fall, and when you look up into the sky, you actually will see different constellations. And if you remember from the, uh, the first lesson, Constellations are groupings of stars. So, you know, the, the, the grouping of stars that I see in summer will be completely gone, and there'll be whole new groupings of stars. And let's talk about why that is. All right. Picture me as the sun, and this will be planet Earth. So, when I'm here, and let's say you're in the northern hemisphere, right here in the United States, and it's nighttime. I'm the sun, so this half of the planet close to me is bright, and this half is dark and night. So you're looking off into the sky, and so they would be seeing all the stars that are towards you in the camera. But as the Earth goes around the sun, and the seasons change, right? Now, nighttime would be over here, because I'm the sun, and daytime is here. So at night, on the dark side of the planet, everyone on the planet at night is looking off to the stars this way, and seeing that night sky. And then again over here, but I'll, st I'll keep moving because you can't see through me on the camera. And then when we get over here to this, this other position, where is the United States, okay? It's off facing in this part of the sky because the light is here. This is day, and now night faces off in this direction. So if you think of it like a, like a boat, you know, that in the, in the summer, they might be facing this way at night and seeing the stars off the front of the boat. And then, then in the, uh, the fall, they might be looking over here, seeing the stars off of this part of the boat, winter back here, and then spring back here. Now here's what's interesting, because we're talking about three dimensions, not just back and forward, left and right, but up and down. All the people on the planet, let's say here we are again in the United States, right? 
over, where are we, there we go, right here, they can always see up at night. So no matter where they are, they can always see the sky up here, facing, up, facing towards north. Um, and they can never see the stars down below the Earth over here because the Earth blocks it. So us up in the United States never see the stars uh, south or below the planet Earth. Now, in the north, northern uh, hemisphere, half of a sphere, or the top part of the Earth, in the northern hemisphere, when we look up into our sky, there is a star that is straight above this pole uh, where the axis comes out of the planet on the North Pole. So straight above the North Pole is a star that we call the North Star. The North Star is uh, also called Polaris or like right above the pole of the North Pole. And so that star always stays fixed and stays in one place in the sky. Now for the rest of the stars and, and, and uh, just like how the Sun and the Moon rise in the East and set in the West, now the constellations change because of the seasons and the earth going around the sun. But they also rise and set in the evening just like the moon and just like the sun. So if you look carefully at the North Pole, all of the constellations will spin, rise and set around the North Pole. And some, like I think uh, the Big Dipper, well it's actually close enough, or the Little Dipper because the Little Dipper is made up with the North Star, doesn't actually ever set, it just spins in a circle around that North Pole. So if here was a little dipper coming off of the, the North Pole, it would just spin right around that North Pole all night long. So um, North Star is Polaris, and we talked about that being part of Little Dipper. A constellation is a grouping of stars, and we'll talk more about those later, but they're classic constellations or groupings. This is a little different. The Little Dipper is not really a constellation. It's actually called an asterism. And an asterism is just kind of like a, a little grouping of stars. Just kind of hold on to that word. There's constellations, which are the most famous of the 12 zodiac constellations. Um, but then there's little tiny like ones that we remember just to help us get little pictures in the sky because it's easier to see, like the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper. Those are not full constellations. They're asterisms. So there's a little bit about why and how the night sky changes. Uh, be sure to check out some of the supplemental things on that one as well. North Star is easy to recognize because it's straight above head, but there's another star in the sky that's easy to recognize. The brightest star in the sky is called Sirius. Now that's when you say to me, are you serious? And I say, no, I'm not serious. It's Sirius. So Sirius is the brightest star in the sky. Um, it's The reason it's but here's an interesting fact about Sirius. It's not actually one star, it's two stars. So if here's the big star, there's the little star, and the little star is in orbit around the big star. So instead of a planet going around the star, it's a star going around a star. This is called a binary star system. Now, you might want to remember that for Gary's computer class. Binary means two, like two... The, the, well, you probably know it from April's class. Bi is two. So hold on to that. Just uh, remember that for your vocabulary. Binary star system is two stars, one little one revolving around another. So, all right, you're going to like this. Here we go. The, the little star is actually called a white dwarf. Now, that's not one of Snow White's seven, but a white dwarf is a type of star that is dying. So this, star, this little star here is in the process of dying as it goes around the big one. So, I had a verse that I wanted to share with you. In Matthew 24, uh, it says, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. And I couldn't resist, you know, knowing that people worship the sun because it's the big ball of fire in the sky that gives us life, that stars do die and they don't last forever. Even our sun won't last forever. They run out of fuel and they burn up. So, don't worship the sun, because it will eventually die and burn up, but worship the sun, S-O-N, because his words and he abides and lives forever. So let's talk about what happens when a star dies. So a dying star, a white dwarf, they run out of fuel. Essentially, like the, they, start to, they start to fizzle out, uh, and what happens is, is the energy starts to run out, 
the, I'm, not, I'm no expert on this, but in the textbooks it talks about how the, the gravity begins to pull everything in and it collapses and then ultimately the, as, as the gravity pulls in it heats up the inside and creates an explosion called a supernova. So when a star begins dying it eventually can, compacts and heats up and explodes into what's called a supernova. You can just think of supernova, it's like a monstrous fire explosion. Uh, believe it or not, in 1054 uh, Chinese astronomers watched and recorded a supernova. Uh, they saw it, and they saw the bright light in the sky that lasted some period of time and then was gone. Uh, and then later on, when modern astronomers looked up into the sky into the spot that the Chinese astronomers recorded it uh, with more powerful telescopes, they actually saw something still there. So when a star goes supernova, it leaves a footprint, like particles and debris and energies that like leave this massive thing called a nebula, which almost looks like a, a spider web. Um, I'll, I'll show you a picture of a nebula right here. Okay, so it leaves this nebula in space, and so where the Chinese astronomers witnessed this uh, supernova, they um, now see what's called the Crab Nebula, which is that picture that you're seeing right there. Um, now, something that can happen when a star goes supernova and explodes is that all the gases and everything burn off and go all, uh, go all over the place, but matter, and your stuff, can be pulled into this gravity so tightly that all, all of the matter kind of compacts and gets super dense, and when something has more matter and it has more mass, it then has more gravity. You got it. So what happens is, it be, is the star, the matter can become so packed and so dense and so uh, powerful with gravity that it begins to pull everything into it. And this can create what's called a black hole. Uh, and the black hole, you can't even actually see it because the gravity is so powerful that it even pulls light into itself. So it's somewhat mysterious. Nobody knows exactly what it is. But they can look at the effect of the things around the black hole and know that there's something out there in space that is holding things with this incredibly powerful gravity. Um, so even though they can't see it, I think this is one of those areas of space where there's lots of theories and uh, hypotheses, hypothesi, hypotheses, um, ideas that people have about what's going on after these stars or after a star dies and creates this kind of phenomena out there. Uh, so, yep, stars do die, they go supernova and can create a black hole. All right, on to the next stuff. Let's just make a quickie point, uh, some simple definitions. Some stars burn steady and stable and even, and other stars burn hotter for a while and then cool down, and then hotter and then cool down. And so one of those is called a perfect star, that's the nice and stable, even, steady star, and the other one is the hotter, colder, hotter, colder variable star because it changes. So which do you think the sun is? I'll give you two guesses. You know what you thought was variable? Well, you're wrong. It is the perfect star because the sun is stable and steady and always shines the same. Because if it wasn't and it got really hot, we burn up and then it cool down and we freeze. And then it'll get hot and we burn up and then it cool down and we freeze. So our sun is a perfect star, nice and steady, and other stars can sometimes be variable stars that change in how hot they burn. So a week or so ago I was sitting in Gary's computer class and he was talking about how to categorize all the different piece, pieces of hardware in a computer. And so he kind of took all these different pieces like monitors and printers and keyboards and hard drives and memory cards and put them each into categories. So it's a method of organization. How do we organize something? We group them into categories. Now there's billions of stars and we have to have some sort of way to categorize them or make distinction between them. And so, are they hotter or colder? Brighter or dimmer? Bigger or smaller? So those are the categories that we rate stars on. So I'll talk a little bit about how, how we rate stars. Uh, when we look at a star, we can tell by its color whether it's hotter or cooler. So for example, like when you look into a, a campfire, there's 
different color flames and the red flame is actually cooler than say the white hot coals in the middle. So there's a scale that we talk about or that they use to categorize whether a star is hotter or colder and it goes like this. O, B, A, F, G, K, M and that's really tricky and if I wanted you to memorize it we'd come up with a mnemonic kind of like uh, kind of like this one here. Um, of Berkeley astronomers, few give kind marks. Of Berkeley astronomers, few give kind marks. So I'm just doing this so you can remember what a mnemonic is and how to use it. Um, I, I made up another one that was called, Our Boy Asks for Golden Kangaroo Monkeys. Money. Sorry. Our Boy Asks for Golden Kangaroo Money. And uh, so I don't know, if you had to memorize it, you could use a mnemonic because it doesn't really make a lot of sense. Like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, that's easy to, re easy to remember. Or 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, that's easy to remember. So just know that they use letters. Our planet is a G. So if this is hottest, or I'm sorry, our sun is a G. So if this is hottest, this is coolest, we're third from the coolest of suns. Or category, categories of suns. Next is the brightest and the dimmest. So that's a real simple category categorization. It's just one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And for the Earth's sun, it is a five. So we're kind of right smack in the middle as far as bright and versus dim. Uh, Sirius, guess what number that would be? Number one, because it'd be really bright. So this scale goes hottest to coldest. This goes brightest to dimmest. Sirius, the brightest star in our sky, would be a one. And of course, this is actually measured from Earth, like how the things appear to us. So the next is biggest to smallest, the size of the star. Um, I'm going to tell you the names for these. It goes Roman numerals one through seven. And so this would be a super giant, a bright giant, a giant, a subgiant, a main sequence star, which I'm not sure what that means, that's just the name of it, a sub dwarf star, and a white dwarf star, like we talked about a minute ago, that orbits Sirius. Sirius. Uh, so there's a star out there called Betelgeuse, that is a type 1 star, it's the most famous of the, the biggest stars out there. So the Earth would be a G55, G five Roman numeral five star and that would be its classification slightly towards the cooler stars right in the middle in terms of brightness and towards the smaller of stars that are out there in the universe let's talk distance for a second um, the way you measure distance in space is called a light year so essentially it is how far light can travel in a year because light has speed. It's something that races across the galaxy. Light travels at the speed of 186,000 miles per second. So we're starting to talk about things that are so incredibly big, so incredibly fast that our brain can't even comprehend these numbers. So let's try to make it at least as, as understandable as we can. It takes eight minutes for light to travel from the sun to the earth. That's 93 million miles from the sun to the earth and it takes eight minutes for the light to get there. Okay, so we know that the sun and the earth are very, very far apart. They're 93 million miles. <coughs> A light year is, oh my goodness, I'm not even sure if I can say this, five trillion nine hundred billion miles. That's how far I can go in a light in a light year. Five trillion nine hundred billion there's million, there's thousands, there's hundreds. Whoa, okay, that's really, really far. I can't even imagine what five trillion nine hundred billion would look like. I can't think of anything that even remotely comes to that number. Now just to get how far away the next closest star to our sun is, is it's Alpha Centauri, that's the closest sun, and it's four light years away. So four times this number. It's like 20 some trillion miles is how close the nearest sun is. So when we start talking about space, 
the numbers are crazy. Like they're a totally different. Oh, here's the word. Uh, magnitude. It's like remember we talked about the heavens. How yeah, the first heavens are nice. You know that the first heavens are um, the sky and the birds and the air and oh, it's really big. I mean, the sky and this earth is really really big. But then if that's the first heaven, to talk about the seventh, second heaven, we're talking about numbers that have a totally different magnitude or, or scale, like a different way of even thinking about them. So when we start talking about this many miles, five trillion, nine hundred billion, and that's just not even going to get us a quarter of the way to the nearest star, well the second heavens are just completely indescribable compared to the first, and so how much more um, beyond our comprehension is the third heaven? So th these numbers are so big that when you get to math class, and you'll, you'll, you'll see, that this is just such a big number to work with, you can't even write it out. It wouldn't even be a, it wouldn't even be a, you know, you'd spend half your time writing the problem and not solving it. So it's a different magnitude altogether that mathematicians have a whole other way of writing these numbers because they're so big. And this is 59 times 10 to the 11th power. And we're not going to get into it because this isn't math class, it's astronomy. But... That is a simplified way of writing this huge, monstrous number down. So, all I want to get across is that when we talk about these distances and these sizes, they're so far beyond our comprehension that even when scientists talk about it, our finite brains can't hardly wrap, our, wrap themselves around these, these magnificent, wondrous dimensions and, and concepts and ideas. You know, we can, we can work the math, but to really, truly understand it or comprehend it just points to the living God and say, Wow, you are so far beyond my comprehension. I can't even imagine what you know. Your thoughts are higher than my thoughts. Your ways are higher than my ways. Who could find them out if you didn't tell them to us? So, uh, last thing I want to talk about, though, too, is sometimes you'll hear scientists say, Well, the Earth must be billions of years old because for the light to travel from the stars, then it would take, you know, so many you know, billions and trillions and quadrillions of years to get there, you know, or miles to travel, I mean, that the Earth must be billions of years old for the light to reach from those stars to us. But they're making a mistake of magnitude that our God is so much bigger than light as the, second, as the third heavens are higher than the second heavens, as 100 miles is to 59 billion miles. Our God is so much bigger than the second heavens that with no effort at all, he can easily create a universe that already has the light in place and it doesn't need to travel for billions of years to get there because he already put it in place. So scientists need to be careful too that they don't confuse the order of magnitude when they think about science and what can be measured in the second heavens and how much further beyond that the third heavens are and how great our God is. Okay, so since we're talking about mind-blowing things, Let's, and orders of magnitude that are beyond what we can comprehend. This is my little picture of a guy whose mind is getting blown, his brain's frying, and steam's coming out of his ears, and his eyes are going, whoa. Let's, let's talk about galaxies. So, uh, in our galaxy, which is called the Milky Way, not the candy bar, just in case. Don't snickers if I'm talking about candy bars. So, in our galaxy called the Milky Way, there are billions of stars. I remember how many zeros there were after billions. It's like, whoa, huge numbers. So there's billions of stars just in our galaxy. But there are billions of galaxies. So billions times billions is just so big that it makes you have to go, there's got to be a God who made all this, who could make all that space and all that stuff. It's just, it's, it's mind-blowing. So, uh, we can't really, I can't, I can't try to help you comprehend the size of galaxies other than to say, just chew on that thought. Uh, and especially as you study more math, it'll, it'll blow your mind to know what billions times billions must be. Um, so, we live in this Milky Way galaxy. You know, you can kind of see it, like, as you look up, you can see, like, uh, in a perfectly clear night with, um, with no... Uh, light pollution, you can kind of see the pink smudginess of our galaxy and the, the stars that come from the Milky Way. That's why it's called the Milky Way, because it looks kind of like a smudgy, milky uh, band in the sky that you can see. 
So enough of that. Let's just talk about when you look into outer space and, and like these telescopes that can go way, way, way out and they can see other galaxies. One of the things you need to know for astronomy is that they have names and different types. So I'll stand over here because maybe I can put some pictures up on the other side. So the first type is called a spiral galaxy. And as you can see, it kind of spirals out. And you can see these arms coming off of the, of the galaxy. The Milky Way is a spiral galaxy. We live in a spiral galaxy. Um, an elliptical uh, galaxy kind of just looks like a smudge. It just pops right there. All right, just kind of, yeah, not, no particular definition to it. Okay, say this one with me, class. Lenticular. Lenticular. Okay, I have, I have a joke for you. What do you call a spiral galaxy with no arms? Ah, lenticular. So it's like, it's like a spiral galaxy, except you can't see the arms coming out of it as much. And then lastly, because there's all kinds of other crazy shapes out there, there's what they call anything that doesn't fit these three, spiral, elliptical, or lenticular, they call it irregular because it's just not regular, it's an odd shape. So there you go, four different shapes of galaxies, talking about billions of stars in billions of galaxies, mind-blowing, crazy-sized stuff. What an incredible universe we live in. Let's finish off this extra-long chapter about the stars with a quick discussion about constellations, or the groupings of the stars. There's 12 major constellations that have been known from ancient times, um, from the beginning even. I'm going to read to you something here from Psalm 19, 1 to 4. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. So these things are speaking and their voice is going out to be heard. Their measuring line goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. So there's something about the stars and the skies and the heavens pouring out knowledge and pouring out words. And so these, these 12 major constellations, easy to remember number, because it's like the 12 tribes of Israel or the 12 apostles, these 12 constellations um, have been there from the beginning. But along the way, they've been turned into something that now gets referred to as the zodiac. And the zodiac is related to astrology. Astrology is different than astronomy. Uh, astro astronomy is the study and science of the stars. Astrology is a religion or a faith regarding the stars. It's the, the worship or worthship of the stars rather than the maker of the stars. Um, so it's kind of it's people who try to tell the future or tell fortunes or predict the future based upon the patterns and the, the movements of the constellations. So this is something that came much later. Uh, the, the, the God who made the stars came first. And so the Hebrews had this thing called the Maseroth, which were still the 12 major constellations. And if you notice, the constellations don't really look much like what they're called, and that's because the primary uh, emphasis wasn't about the shape, it was about the names, it was about the story, it was about the message. So they gave these groupings of stars names and tried to draw pictures to help remember it, but the, it was the names and the ages that were important. So it was telling a story in the stars. And I'm not going to get into that now. I, you could spend a lot of time talking about the different constellations and how they tell the story of the gospel, you know, of, the, of Leo, the, the lion who was to come, of Virgo, the virgin, and things like that. So I will put that in the supplemental material for you to take a look at and to enjoy and peruse at your leisure. Uh, but right now, I just wanted you to understand that there were 12 major constellations that moved through the sky that some would call them the Zodiac and practice astrology with them, while some recognize them as the Maseroth and can see and tell and use them to tell the story of God and the story of the gospel in the stars. Great job. Lots of patience today. I will see you in class shortly. Wait! Hold on! I have one more thing I wanted to show you that I thought was really cool, which I knew you would enjoy. The Magi. 
So, in the story of the Gospel with Jesus' birth, in Matthew chapter 2, listen to this. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men, or magi, and people are magi, people believe that those were wise men or astronomers, those who watched the heavens. Uh, they came, uh, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. So think about it. No TV, no newspapers. They were looking at the stars and the stars were telling them the story. And they came from the east all the way across the world to come and find the king who they knew was to be born king of the Jews. Fascinating stuff. I hope you look at the supplemental material and enjoy, but it's all even throughout scriptures. This is just glorious, wonderful stuff. See you in class.